Welcome back to Book View Now, our coverage of the Miami Book Fair on a very beautiful Sunday here in Miami, Florida. I'm Jeffrey Brown of the PBS NewsHour, and I'm joined now by Stephen Johnson about his new book, Wonderland, How Play Made the Modern World. Hello again. Hey. Nice to see you. Nice to see you a again, A history too. of play. Yeah. Which means what? Well, a history, basically, of things that people did purely for the fun of it, right? We, we tend to, when we're taught what the kind of primary drivers of history are, yeah. right? You think about the kind of quest for power, you think about national Wars identity, war, politics, yeah. accumulating wealth, yeah. survival, all these right. things. And what this book is trying to argue is that, in fact, alongside those forces, which are obviously real forces, there is this other force of, of play, of delight, of wonder, of people doing things because they're initially amusing mm -hmm. and entertaining. But what happens surprisingly often actually in that history is that things that started off as kind of toys and games end up triggering all these momentous changes in society leading to technological revolutions or leading to political upheaval. Mm -hmm. And so this, this kind of realm of play and delight deserves to have a, a, a kind of a place at the table yeah, when we yeah, talk I mean, about historical you're, you're making an argument that play and entertainment and a, it sort of leads rather than follows. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And there, and there, so the book is kind of divided up into uh, kind of six broad categories. There's fashion and shopping and games and uh, illusion and kind of leisure spaces. Yeah, and I so mean, on. Just, we, should, we should define play. Yeah. Because right? you have an interesting sort of broad take on it. It's not just sort of sitting down and doing games, but fashion, clothing, things like that. So yeah, tell me how I, you thought I actually, it. I borrowed a line from uh, Brian Eno, the, the, uh, the great musician and artist yeah. and producer. He, had, he, he gave a lecture a couple years ago where he talked about art and culture as being all the things we don't have to do. <laughs> uh -huh. right? so, so we need clothes, but we don't need fashionable clothes particularly. Right. And uh, you know, we, we need to have food, but we don't necessarily need... I'm going to be Tommy Hilfiger a right, little right. later, exactly. so I can ask, I'll exactly. ask him, why do we need those? Yeah, yeah. And, 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 you're right. and it encompasses a lot of different things, right? I mean, it, there's a chapter on the spice trade, because yeah. spices don't have a nutritional value, but there's something just enjoyable and interesting about the flavors that they introduced, right? And so it is putting a lot of different things in into this kind of overarching category of, of play and delight, but I think if, if you don't do that, you miss the overall importance of this side of, of human culture, really. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I don't want to belabor the point, but as I was looking, th reading through it, it's like the creative side of people, right? Yeah. Now, the creative side, it, on one hand, you could say, well, we don't need all these things, but on the other hand, creativity is part of who we are, too, right? Yeah. So there, there's sort of, it's sort of innate to our, our natures. It, it is. It's an interesting side of uh, uh, of our nature as human being in the sense that it, it isn't something that has an obvious survival value and yet it is a very old history, right? So in, in, there's a chapter about musical instruments, yeah. right? And the, it, it starts with these bone flutes that, are, that they found that are over 40,000 years old. Right. And so if you think about it, it, it's, you know, our Paleolithic ancestors are sitting there you know, they've, they've, they've mastered fire and they've built simple garments and they have simple tools for hunting and, right. and things like that. There's a whole world left right. to be invented. Right. And yet one of the first things they do at this point is invent devices that push around air mm -hmm. molecules for mm -hmm. no apparent reason. It's no functional value, but there's something interesting in that sound. And that's, that's an old, old story, as old as the quest for power or the quest for yeah. survival. And I think it's kind of a nice thing to remember that this is part of our humanity, as well as an important thing in terms of understanding what drives history. Well, but you're doing more than that because you're taking, you're starting with musical instruments and then showing how it somehow leads us to, I mean, computers. Computers. And, right? Yeah. So, but that's a big leap. I yeah. Mean, at yeah. least it sounds like a big yeah, leap, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what ends up happening is that there's this really interesting long connection between computers and, and, and musical instruments, which you would think, the, the standard story about computers is that they came out of the military, right? right. That we, we built these computers to crack wartime codes right. and to calculate rocket trajectories <coughs> and things like that. But in fact, in, in the book I talk about this uh, device that was created uh, over a thousand years ago in, in Baghdad at the height of the Islamic golden age by these brilliant engineers who were working in a place called the House of Wisdom in mm -hmm. Baghdad, which is great. Mm -hmm. And they created this device called the instrument that plays itself. And it was basically 
a kind of glorified music box. Mm -hmm. And it could, you could program it to play different songs. It actually was a kind of a flute player. And it was like a kind of robotic flute player, getting back to the flutes. But what was crucial about it is that if you wanted it to play a different song, you could take out this kind of cylinder where you'd encoded the song and you could put in another cylinder. Mm -hmm. and, and what that meant was it was really the first programmable machine in the history of the world. And the, the, the idea between hardware yeah. and software huh. is kind of introduced with this machine. And programmability, which is a very powerful idea, machines that can be shifted in their function to do other things down the line, that is, that is a huge yeah. revolutionary idea. It stays in music for like 700 years. And it's kept alive by these programmable music boxes. And then people start thinking about programmable looms that you could get to weave fabrics of, of right, different right. colors and patterns and so on. And then finally that idea goes to calculation. And people think, wait, we could build a machine that yeah. could be programmable to calculate. And so music actually kept this idea in circulation for, for centuries and centuries. So it, it's, the book is filled with stories. What about, I mean, so, so fashion, for example, where, what, what is that? I've been thinking about this, this chapter a lot in the last couple of weeks, actually, because it's, it, it's directly relevant in a way to our political situation, as unlikely as it seems. So <laughs> in, the, in the late 1600s in, in London and, and a few other kind of metropolitan centers in Europe, uh, this craze developed among well-to-do women for the, this extraordinary new fabric from India, calico mm -hmm. and, and chintz. That yeah. were, one, they were cotton, so they were, they were soft, but they had these beautiful patterns that would survive being washed multiple times, mm -hmm. which was unusual mm -hmm. at the time. And this became this kind of runaway hit, basically, this new fabric, partially because p people would wear it as underwear, and up until that point, they'd, they'd worn wool underwear, right, which is right. not pleasant at all. So this <laughs> soft and beautiful thing comes yeah. into the world. People go crazy for it. It becomes a huge economic uh, boon for the East India Company. A tr massive trade imbalance opens up with India. I see. And I it, among the wool industry in England, there's this kind of backlash mm -hmm. from this overseas global threat of global trade. Yeah. And all these women who were buying calico are shamed in public. They're called calico madams. Calico is banned for a stretch of time. At no point in human history has women's underwear provoked such you know, political animus, yeah. right? Uh, and so you have this outrage devel developing, but simultaneous to this period, a number of engineers and inventors start to think, well, wait a second, maybe we could build machines that could create and weave this cotton ourselves, and that becomes the Industrial Revolution, huh. right? And so, in a sense, we have this traditional story that industrialization happens, and then people get wealthy enough to be interested in things right. like shopping right. and fashion, but actually right. it's the other way around. It starts yeah. with this moment of delight with this fabric, and that's what sets the wheels of industry in motion in the first place. This was clearly a fun book for you to, to research. And it's, and it's an, it was incredibly fun. I mean, it came out of actually, of, of how we got to now, the book and the, and the PBS series that we did a couple of years ago, same kind of structure of yeah. looking at these innovations and their unlikely consequences, but, uh, but this one has this argument too about about yeah. history that was really that was really fun. How do you choose your subjects? Because you're always picking kind of interesting, <laughs> yeah, uh, sort of offbeat takes on right. on history or who we are kind of thing. Right? Well, you know, with this, I, it, it's funny. Each chapter, I had a little foothold from something that I had learned over the years. You know, it's just the process of like you accumulate things yeah. and you store them away, right? And mm -hmm. so, l later on in that shopping chapter, there's a story about how the first department stores. Uh, in Paris in the, in the uh, 1800s, they initiated this wave of kleptomania among well-to-do women who mm -hmm. could afford to buy everything in the Bon Marché, these fancy new department yeah. stores, but somehow yeah. they were overwhelmed by the displays, and so they started stealing, <laughs> and it became this huge issue, right? So I had heard about yeah. this story yeah. when I was in grad school. You know, Zola wrote about it in, in, yeah. in one of his novels, uh, <laughs> Ladies' Paradise, and so it's just been sitting in my brain for, for 24 years or so until finally I started thinking, it would be fun to write about shopping and fashion, and I thought, ah, I've got that story, and so each know, chapter Steve, had a little you anchor. Got, you, got, you, got, you got women's underwear <laughs> and uh, kleptomania in early... It sounds a lot racier than it actually is. I'm sad to say, but that's fine. <laughs> Let me just ask you, because we're at a book festival, I've been trying, to, and I especially want to ask you, because you, because you do have this wide uh, interest. What do, what do you read? What do you read for pleasure? What, what? 
Or are you always reading for the books you're working on or the projects? Yeah, well, what changed is uh, I, I am always reading. I, mean, I like to have two or three books going at a time that I'm reading that, yeah. and, and that I'm writing and that I'm yeah. researching. Um, so there's a lot of research. But I, I went to, as I kind of alluded to, I went to grad school in English literature. So I read a ton of 19th century novels when I was 24. You know, I was like living in the world of Dickens and yeah. Balzac and all that kind of stuff. And then I really stopped reading fiction for a long time. And something about when I turned 40, uh -huh. that, that suddenly I felt this need for kind of literary fiction in, in my life, um, having lived it so intensely in, in my 20s. And so now when I'm escaping research, uh, I'm almost always you know, reading some kind of novel. That's, that's, that's what I have. The older I get, the more I have an appetite for that. All right, the new book is Wonderland, How Play Made the Modern World. Stephen Johnson, thank you. Thanks.